Good afternoon and welcome to Remaking the Economy in Los Angeles. I'm Steve Dubb and I'm senior editor here at Nonprofit Quarterly. Uh, today we'll be discussing Los Angeles, California and how nonprofits and social movement activists are finding ways to address economic and social inequalities. Uh, for this conversation, uh, we will be joined by three expert speakers. Uh, Roxana Tynan is executive director of the Los Angeles Alliance for New Economy, better known as LANE. Isela Gracian is the executive director of East Los Angeles Community Corporation, or ELAC. And last but not least, we have Ana Siria Ursua. She's a sustainability director for Santa Ana uh, Building Healthy Community Site, as well as co-founder of Cooperacion uh, Santa Ana. We will also be showing a video interview uh, with uh, Manuel Pastor, uh, director of the Program for Environmental Regional Equity at the University of Southern California and author of States of Resistance. Uh, a few notes before we get started. Uh, first, we're very excited to take all your questions and we will be leaving plenty of time at the end of the webinar to answer them. Uh, please enter the questions you have into the question box, which is on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and I will share them with the panelists when we get to that part of, this of today's discussion. Uh, second, um, we will be sharing uh, slides and recordings with everyone via email after the after the webinar. Lastly, uh, we are happy to offer this, and we're committed actually to offering these webinars free of charge. Uh, but of course, they're not free to produce. So uh, I know a number of you have already donated uh, to support our economic uh, work, and to all of you, I say thank you. Uh, for those who have yet to contribute, please consider doing so today. Uh, the John R. O'Shea Foundation, it's a local private foundation in Buffalo, New York, um, has generously agreed to match uh, your donations. So every dollar you donate today will go twice as far. Um, you can also support the work by joining the conversation via social mm -hmm. media uh, with our hashtag, uh, hashtag rebuild the economy. Uh, share your comments and questions. We'd love to hear them. So thanks for being with us today. And also, uh, we will be having a brief survey after the webinar, so please keep a lookout for that window after our conversation. And at this point, I'll shift to um, uh, share a few slides which will frame uh, today's discussion. So um, again, this is part of a series, um, uh, and, and the, you know, some of the reasons we, we do these webinars are to build awareness, um, identify uh, examples and best practices, um, question narratives, particularly ones that talk about uh, the economy, uh, you know, being the product of people from up high as opposed to uh, communities who are actually creating uh, the wealth below, um, highlight changes um, and um, uh, emphasize connections between the different efforts. Um, so Los Angeles, it's a very big place, uh, 13 million people, 4 million just within the city limits. Uh, and I tried to highlight on uh, this map, it's a little hard to see, but in the lower right-hand corner, that's where Santana is. Uh, in the middle is uh, uh, downtown Los Angeles and a little bit to the east is, is East Los Angeles. Um, uh, so a couple of things to note about, uh, about Los Angeles, it's the leading manufacturing center in the United States, bar none. Uh, over 500,000 jobs, so that's more than you find in Chicago, Detroit, places that are better known for manufacturing, but actually the largest center is Los Angeles. It's a major port uh, between the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles. You're talking about a uh, billion dollars of goods a day coming into um, uh, the region and, and, and the country. And uh, it's uh, also a place where Unlike much of the United States, unions are growing, and, and they now currently represent about 16.5% of workers, according to the latest uh, study at UCLA. Next slide. Um, and these are the folks that we're going to talk with, with today. They'll, they'll talk about their organizations uh, themselves. So I won't steal too much of their th thunder, um, uh, but Lane and, and ELAC have both been around uh, since the 1990s, uh, Santa Ana Building Healthy Communities. Uh, more recent formation, it's one of the uh, building healthy community sites of the California Endowment, which has invested, I believe it's a billion dollars over 10 years in, in uh, over 10 communities in California uh, to try to connect uh, health and public health and community change. 
Um, and, and these are just some of the questions that we that the panelists will be answering through their presentations and through their answers to questions I ask and your questions. You know, what is your community? What are your challenges? Where is their leverage? And how is your work helping to change economic structures and systems to, to empower your communities? You know, so this is the third in a series. Uh, our, our webinars are every third Thursday and uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific time, and please join us. Um, so with that, we will go to the um, interview I did with uh, Man Manuel Pastor. Hello, and, and we're here uh, in the webinar with Manuel Pastor, a professor of sociology and director of the program uh, for environmental regional equity at the University of Southern California and author of uh, States of Resistance. Uh, Manuel, uh, welcome to the webinar. Glad to be with you. Uh, to begin, could you, could you talk a little bit about your background? Well, I, I'm a working class son of immigrants. Grew up in the Los Angeles area. Uh, and of course that had a sort of profound impact on me, both being an LA kid, but also understanding the tough situation of working class people in the United States and the discrimination uh, faced by uh, an immigrant father trying to make his way uh, up the mobility ranks. Uh, great, thanks. You know, this webinar series is about remaking economic systems and certainly LA has an impressive ecosystem of, of social movements. Uh, what would you say have been the most effective interventions that the social movements have made in, in the LA economy? To look at sort of the LA of today, you have to understand that there's been a real arc of change particularly an arc of change in the wake of the 1992 civil unrest, in which a lot of sort of social movement leaders began to realize that if you've got a city that's angry enough to burn itself down in protestation of police brutality and economic deprivation, and you haven't been able to take that anger and channel it into something more productive in terms of social change, there might be something wrong not just with the system, but the way that you're organizing against it. And so you saw in Los Angeles something which I think is really caught on more generally in California and is of course catching on across the country as well. A shift toward trying to uh, do multiracial organizing focused on bread and butter issues and also be very intersectional at the same time. So living wage movement, uh, which really began in Baltimore, but took strong root here, and then moved to pioneering community benefits agreements in which big projects done by developers would have to bring benefits to communities in terms of housing, jobs, parks, food access, et cetera. And then going on from there to being one of the first big cities to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and helping to push the state of California into doing that as well. And of course, we've seen some pioneering stuff going on with regard to the green economy. The fact that we have taxed ourselves to the tune of about $140 billion to lay out a new transit system. And we're trying to pay attention to the jobs that's going to generate the housing that needs to be put alongside, et cetera. So I think there's been a, a lot of uh, movement along the way. Great, thanks. Could you talk about some of the practices that have been used to, to help bridge divides among ethnic and racial communities? Um, I'll uh, personalize it. Um, in 2007, uh, I was asked to, along with Karen Bass, a congresswoman from South LA uh, and the founder of a group called the Community Coalition, African-American uh, woman, uh, to uh, lead a discussion in South Los Angeles on black brown histories and black brown organizing. In the 70s and the 80s, 25% of all the immigrants coming into the United States were coming in through Los Angeles. Some of the first questions off the bat were someone who raised their hand and said, a young African-American man, you know, I used to like Mexicans, but I just don't like these new Mexicans, by which he meant Central Americans. And someone else, actually an older African-American gentleman who said, well, you know, the problem is that young black people don't want to work and these immigrants are taking uh, those jobs because of that. Now, what's interesting is you might think that that's a gap, 
But what that was was the beginning of a very real dialogue about what people were actually feeling at the time. And that real dialogue as, you know, it wasn't the sort of polite discussion about race that occurs in an academic classroom or in a, uh, a nonprofit or in a found or in foundation world. It was the kind of real conversation on the ground about what was the African-American experience and what was the immigrant experience. And that hard conversation around black and brown lives led to black and brown organizing to pass the first retrofitting bill in Los Angeles mandating that our uh, public institutions retrofit to fit uh, to deal with climate change and that there be special job programs for young African Americans and young Latinos to be able to get those jobs in the retrofitting. So I think that one of the things that's been a secret in California is to not shy away from the difficult conversations that need to occur at a community level. Great, thanks. I wanted to ask about a report you guys produced a couple of years ago, and it found that, um, you know, despite all the successes in, of social movements in LA, that LA County was the seventh most unequal county of the 150 surveyed. And so uh, why is that and uh, what can be done? Well, I think uh, there's a couple of important things to realize. One is that California sits at the heart of the new economy and it's an economy that's inherently disequalizing. These days, monopoly is built into the nature of the economy because it's a platform economy in which there's only two rideshare uh, companies basically, and they're each trying to drive each other out of business. Uh, everybody is using Google. People are pegged to Facebook. I'm not, but people are pegged to uh, Facebook, which winds up gobbling Instagram when it realizes people are moving in that direction. The platform is everything, so monopoly power is built into the economy. The other thing is that really, the social movement organizations have acquired kind of political and policy power, but it's actually a fairly recent phenomena in terms of that actually becoming governing power and really setting policy. So community benefits, that's really only been around for 10 to 15 years, and it's really only scaled up in the last five. The minimum wage stuff is new. We're beginning to see some improvements from that. Great. Um I wanted to ask, you know, do you think um, that social movements, you know, have uh, this uh, theory of underlying theory of the economy? Has that sunken in at the at the neighborhood and community level? I think this is really one of the biggest challenges. What social movements are doing generally is proposing sort of a redistribution of resources from a group that's been favored to a group that's been less favored. And so having kind of a theory about why that's a good thing to do uh, and also why that's not necessarily going to kill the uh, economic goose uh, is actually pretty important. And that's a sort of pretty big gap uh, currently for most progressives. And I think it's a gap because of the way that we've traditionally thought about the economy. You know, uh, the economic theorists often talk about thinking about people in terms of self-interest and that they act in their own self-interest and that the, the market will coordinate that self-interest into a blissful outcome. Progressives, on the other hand, also think people are acting in their self-interest, but they think that, well, we need to constrain that with the government, with the state. The problem with that view is a lot of things. One is, you know, the same government that's over policing in communities of color is not likely to be a government that's going to be trusted all, all the time around its economic regulation. Um, so communities have a sort of distrust to the state. And, you know, so we need to come up with a sort of different response. And the one that we've been playing with is this idea of solidarity or mutuality that people, yes, they do act in their self-interest, but they also act deeply out of impulses of solidarity or mutuality. Great, uh, thanks. I uh, wanted to ask about one potential tool for a solidarity economy, with, you know, which is uh, worker co-ops. Where do you see success in, in putting uh, solidarity uh, principles into practice and, and what steps need to be taken to, to build those efforts up? There's a whole branch, uh, particularly in Europe, 
of economists and social movement actors that use solidarity economy, and they're referring specifically to the worker co-op movement. But when I talk about, and my colleague Chris Benner talk about solidarity economics, we're trying to think about solidarity at scale. So I'll give you an example. The Restaurant Opportunities Center uh, has a really interesting model where, as you know, they've got their own worker co-op restaurants in several cities. But they've also got a program to organize private restaurant tours into an organization of high road restaurants that pay their workers appropriately, that give them uh, hours that make some sense uh, and try to treat those workers right. And they're also trying to organize the restaurant workers themselves into unions to be representative. And one of the things that Rock has taken on quite a bit is racism within the restaurant industry to make sure that people often get stuck at the back washing dishes, wind up getting a chance to go to the front and be able to do the kind of work that actually yields high tips, et cetera. So to me, that's sort of solidarity of scale. You got a worker co-op piece, you're trying to organize the employers so that they're partly hard, high, so that they are uh, high road, and you're trying to reward them by having consumers play their part in the economy, and you're trying to organize the workers as well. Great, thanks. Um, well, that, that wraps up my questions. Is there anything else you would like to add before we conclude? We live in tremendously challenging times. It's going to take creative social movement organizing that actually has a community base that tackles difficult issues and tough conversations that builds intersectional ties between communities to be able to put this forward. And it has a relentless sense of optimism that we really can do this, that we really can make the world that we deserve. Great, uh, thanks uh, uh, to uh, Manuel Pastor and uh, we will return to uh, the webinar, thanks so much. Thank you. Great, and first we'll hear from Roxana Tynan. Roxana? Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so as Manuel said, during the 70s and 80s, we had this incredible influx of immigrants um, from Central America, particularly, as well as from Mexico, some of them who had really been radicalized by the fights for liberation in Nicaragua and El Salvador. And those folks were coming into an LA where the labor movement was very weak, traditionally had been very weak, very small, but we had the good fortune of a set of leaders, including Maria Elena Lurazo, Miguel Contreras, Eliseo Medina, who had all come out of the United Farm Workers and really wanted to take this incredible energy and build a movement for low wage workers, a movement that was intersectional. And they recognized that because they had relatively small numbers, they had to work with community allies in order to build enough power to make the kind of changes that would benefit uh, the janitors, the hotel workers, um, the other folks that they were trying to organize. And so um, I think as Manuel also said, you know, the, the um, LA uprising in the early 90s also demonstrated the incredible need to build alliances that individually nobody in our movement had the power to make the kind of change we wanted. So we had to build alliances in, in order to really win um, and also really think about politics and what it would take to put our allies into government um, in order to really make change. Next slide. Um, and so one of the ideas, as Manuel was talking about, one of the ideas we had and this came about, uh, we were founded in 93 by Maria Elena and Miguel, uh, wanting to build alliances again. And an idea that we had came out of looking at all the subsidies that were happening in um, Los Angeles, going to real estate development that were not necessarily translating to good jobs. Um, and so, we had this idea along with a lot of other folks about how do you take you know when a development happens um you've got the city or the redevelopment agency you've got the developer and then you've got a whole bunch of of groups that want to try and get something out of that development and unfortunately they can get pitted against each other right should we get a park or should we have affordable housing 
And so what we tried to do was to build an alliance of organizations um, that could, among ourselves, figure out what our bottom lines were, and then really try and back each other up in ensuring that if public money in particular was going into development that we were going to get something for it. So a couple of the examples I wanted to talk about were LA Live, which was led by a group called Strategies for a Just Economy here in LA, and we were part of the coalition that helped win this agreement. Um, we negotiated with the developers who wanted big subsidies and support from the city, and we won um, a significant amount of affordable housing. We won living wage agreements for the workers in the project. We won targeted hire to ensure that the folks most impacted by the development could also access the quality jobs. We won money for parks and other benefits. And the other picture is uh, NoHo Commons in North Hollywood, part of LA, where we won a similar package of living wage, um, targeted hiring, affordable housing, a million dollars for a childcare center. Um, and we would not have been able to win that stuff if we were all coming at the city and the developer individually, but coming together and thinking in a more intersectional way was uh, an opportunity to really try and shift the conversation about economic development. As we were doing these individual developments, we also wanted to try and step back and think, how do we look at an entire industry and try and use what we're learning about organizing and power building to impact an entire industry? Um, and one of the examples I wanted to share was, you know, we as a, as a region voted to tax ourselves to build a public transit system. And we wanted to make sure that the jobs building that transit system would be high quality, career path union jobs, but also the LA residents from LA's poorest communities would have access to those jobs. Um, interestingly, in California, the vast majority of um, union apprentices are Latinx, but we've had a real challenge ensuring that African Americans also had access to high quality union jobs, and that was a real focus of this policy. Um, we won a requirement that 40% of the jobs on the project had to go to targeted low-income neighborhoods um, and also specifically targeting disadvantaged workers. So that was a great test for us. And we have since then looked to really build, um, build those kinds of victories that look at an entire industry in our region. Um, and some of those industries where we've won include um, hotels, um, we've looked at ports, we've worked at waste and recycling, and in all those cases we've built alliances between, for example, environmental organizations as well as labor unions and community allies in order to win victories that really regulate in the interests of the common good. Um, and as Manuel mentioned, one of the victories that came out of not lane particularly but a are a broad coalition of groups was the minimum wage victory we started that victory i think when we won the hotel minimum wage um, and used sort of the energy coming off of that to then push for a citywide 15 dollar minimum wage which we will reach um in within a year um, and we really believe that that success in Los Angeles helped to lay the groundwork for the statewide minimum wage, which we uh, won recently. I'll stop there. Okay, and next up is Isela Gracian. Isela. Excited to be here with, with everybody in this conversation. Um, also very excited of the revival of solidarity economies and, and solidarity housing here in, in California and the United States. Um, so I'll, share, I'll start off sharing the, the beginnings of, of East LA Community Corporation. Um, as, as we heard from, from Manuel and Roxana, the mid 90s was a pivotal point for movement building in Los Angeles. And that is where our organization started with our four founders looking around in their neighborhood of Bull Heights and unincorporated East LA, so just east of downtown Los Angeles, and really asking themselves, what, what was different in their community given that around that time there was 
development organizations that were focused on housing and rebuilding, but yet the their community was was not um, was not changing in the sense that there was a lot of aborted and abandoned buildings. There was the the plight of the crack epidemic. There was um, a lot of violence happening at the time. So our four founders um, took the um, the decision to, to found East LA Community Corporation with a critical analysis and lens to other development corporations that one of the reasons why the neighborhood wasn't shifting was because development organizations were not building community power to have deep transformative change. So East LA Community Corporation was founded with community real estate development and community organizing from its inception. And we started block by block. Um, one house at a time, um, homes that had been foreclosed on. And in this time frame was also when the federal government put a stake in the ground of getting out of the business of housing. So federal HOPE 6 programs were underway where they were demolishing public housing and not building back the same number of units of housing. So in Bull Heights, two, two public housing units, Pico Aliso and Aliso Gardens, um, were being demolished the residents potential for displacement so the idea was that those the homes that we were able to develop as an organization we'd be able to connect residents that were being displaced from public housing into those homes through that work we realized that people weren't ready for home ownership and gave way to what is now our community wealth and our third arm of our transformative change model of really focusing on financial stability for community residents from first-time home ownership to credit building and about three years ago, we fully integrated cultural vitality into our work. Prior to that, within our community organizing efforts, we used arts and cultural practices to engage residents from um, songs that we would change lyrics to, to doing um, teatro based on the UFW model of Teatro Campesino. Um, and now that it's grown to really fully be part of our internal transformation, as well as the work that we're doing with community residents. Next slide. And over time, we've really grown the, the impact that we have as an organization now serving over 6,000 people annually. Um, one of our biggest uh, campaigns that, that gets the most publicity is the Los Angeles street vending campaign. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, we started organizing street vendors in the neighborhood of Bull Heights, uh, really with our ask of a moratorium on enforcement. And that ask was met with no's. So we started looking at what were policy shifts that needed to be made so that the livelihood of so many of our neighbors and residents and fellow Angelinos would not be threatened. So what started as a neighborhood-based um, approach to, to a challenge, we grew into a citywide campaign, um, which last year we, were, we won a street vending permit uh, process in the city of Los Angeles, which is an implementation mode. And that citywide campaign grew to a statewide campaign that also last year, Governor Brown signed into law a decriminaliza decriminalization uh, efforts across the state for street vendors. And then we've leveraged over $200 million in investment through our developments. Um, so all of this work, we started thinking about that we were being successful as an organization uh, yet community-wide indicators over time were not, uh, we weren't seeing the same level of success, right? We were building housing, we were impacting, we are impacting policy, we are building housing, but yet the numbers around homelessness are growing, our community residents, the, the chasm between what they earn and ability to purchase a home was um, becoming bigger. So next slide. So we started talking about what needed to shift in our work. And we started talking about this cycle of, um, that we were working from a cycle of resistance, um, where an injustice happened, we had an intention of shifting, an uh, uprising was happening, there was a paradigm shift, and we had ideas around innovation. But because we're in the cycle of resistance, we were falling back into the, the same cycle without an opportunity to really root in these different ideas. So we're in a phase of shifting our, our framework to be in a cycle of regeneration and spending more time in innovation and this piece of rooting with ideas around collective ownership and stewardship of land, home, and work. Next slide. 
So through through that process and organizational growth and, and evolution, um, we really looked at within solidarity economy and solidarity housing, how we could support a local economic system where in the swings of the economy, the target population, particularly low income people of color, if we're in an upswing in the economy, they have they feel greater pressures around housing, even though their their um, work may be a little bit more stable. And in downswings in the economy, the work is less stable, but yet their housing is still challenged if they can't make um, their rent. So we started looking at and and found and supported the founding of a community land trust called Fideicomiso Tierra Libre. Um, and within the, those conversations, community residents are looking at shared equity cooperative housing. Um, in addition to the, the community land trust, we have one site that um, we're working with the tenants to purchase the property from us in a collective ownership, and that's called Vallejo. And we supported the formation of our first worker-owned cooperative um, called Coopera. And on your screen in the yellow, you just see um, a song. So part of how cultural vitality gets integrated into our work is a process of being able to doc have conversations and document the work. So that's a song that came out of the conversations with the community land trust. Um, and then last slide, um, as we go through the conversations, if anybody in the audience would um, like to connect directly to our organization, here's uh, some information. But I'll, I'll pause there and pass it to, to Anna, um, and then we'll get into questions. So thank you. Lucella, uh, thank you. And Anna, you're up next. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, Again, my name is Ana Ursua, and I just wanted to add to the conversation by talking a little bit about Orange County and more specifically Santana. Um, we, there, it's been described for, for a long time as uh, really getting behind the orange curtain because as we know, uh, Orange County has a history of uh, accumulation of wealth and conservatism, really a hotbed for anti-immigrant sentiment in uh, policies nationally. Um, but Santana, situated right in the middle of the county, is a very young city and an immigrant city. And with a lot of the activation and, uh, um, and getting voting power, especially from our young people to the polls, we're seeing that changing. It, prior to, to 2009, Santana was already experiencing a lot of organizing, particularly around the development um, and gentrification that we were city, seeing in our community. Um, like, like Roxana described, there was organizing that even led to a fight around a community benefits agreement in, in a development project in our city. Um, and it was around this time in the year 2009 or 2010 that the California Endowment um, presented its 10 year uh, proposal to, be, to invest in communities across California. Uh, and their premise was that where you live shouldn't dictate uh, how long you will live. Uh, and that's because it's clear that there are disparities in the in health conditions of communities depending on where you live. And for us in uh, uh, Santana, we welcome that, um, that those investments certainly because our community um, is sitting in the middle of this conservative and wealthy county uh, was experiencing the, the health impacts of those disparities. Um, and the California Endowment and the Building Healthy Communities Initiative arrived and really augmented a lot of the, the organizing that was already happening, like I said, with the uh, with, uh, um, with CBA campaign that then led uh, into a, a citywide policy to change the way that development happens in our community by uh, growing notification to residents and incorporating participation from the beginning as opposed to the end when there was very little possibilities of participation. But the visioning of what the 10 years would be, would be um, how the 10 years would be utilized and, and, and the supports um, would, would be put into place really led into long-term visioning, root cause analysis, and looking at the ways that we would transform our city. Uh, definitely, uh, have, you know, designing it as a community-led process made all the difference because community members that were directly impacted were at the table for this analysis. And, um, and we uncovered that at, at the root cause, there was structural 
um, racism and an unequal distribution of resources, as, as many of our um, speakers have shared. And really what community members started to, um, to call for was a need to prioritize um, civic engagement and community participation and decision making uh, so that community members were activated and a part of the decisions that were happening that would affect their lives. And of course, immigration stood out as one of the, way, one of the things that we were going to need to address in order to be able to see the benefits to our community because people uh, would say, yeah, it, uh, even if there's new new jobs or more job opportunities, if those those of us that aren't documented are not going to be able to um, to to benefit. And so the visioning also led into what what are alternative strategies? Uh, com Im uh, immigrant community members from also Central America and Mexico had the experience with strategies like cooperative um, businesses, where those who are the workers would be the owners. Um, and we knew that it, that it was an important strategy, especially in immigrant communities who weren't going to have access to employment, um, but, that they, but that could be owners. Um, so that, that the early visioning really led to um, uh, those questions of, uh, of ownership in, in addition to um, community outreach and engagement. Um, which has led it also and translated also into uh, and added into the policy organizing that we've seen in our, in our city um, in in over the years as as a result of um, of the com of community um, activism and especially around strategies like worker cooperatives and ownership of land. Uh, Santana passed it is a resolution as a first city in Orange County to formally support worker cooperatives um, and is in, a, in development to be able to offer different supports, um, both by formally acknowledging cooperatives um, and working on uh, develop, and, and creating additional policies like, a, like worker cooperative ordinance. Also in Santana, uh, we've had the uh, the founding of the com of, uh, of the first community land trust um, in Orange County, and it's called or um, in in the city of Santana, and it's called Thrive Santana, uh, and it is it modeled off after other member driven community land trust where people who are um, uh, neighboring different different sites that could be development projects are also informing what that development project ought to look like and who it should service. Uh, and a combination of what we've learned over the years with this opportunity to have uh, 10 years of focused um, uh, organizing and investments is that, the, first of all, the organizing ha it has to be community driven by the folks that are directly impacted. Um, we've been able to uh, organize along with youth, young people, immigrants, um, and really design processes that are governed and community owned um, by setting up steering committees and decision making tables within the Building Healthy Communities Initiative and also in, in, the, in the grassroots efforts and the organizations that have emerged. And one of the big lessons has been the need um, to, to transform and uh, even the organizing culture. So. Uh, uh, Big investments um, of, of our time and resources are also lending themselves into what are other ways um, to incorporate restorative justice, um, transformative justice, and, and health and wellness in organizing as we seek to do that and implement it into our um, policies and into the conditions of health for our entire city. I'll, I'll go ahead and pause there. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh... Thanks, Anna, for that presentation. Thanks, uh, all three of you, Roxana and Sel as well. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is go, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'm going to start asking your questions. So if you haven't entered your questions into the question box yet, please do so, and I will get to as many as I can. Um, I thought I'd start in terms of questions because it, it's, I mean, I saw the, the sign that was uh, permanecer y prosperar, you know, to remain and to prosper. Uh, gentrification is obviously a huge issue throughout the Los Angeles region, right? Um, so what do you see as some of the most uh, viable community strategies to address housing and land use and sort of, you know, both improve conditions for the residents without having them uh, forced out? 
So I, I, can, I can start. Um, this, one of a critical component or environmental factor that um, has created our, our evolution in our approach um, was that back in 2006, we started uplifting the, the pressures of gentrification in Bull Heights and the potential for displacement of long-term community residents that, um, that I share with folks that when nobody else was investing with dollars, they were investing literally with their lives. And that really motivated us as an organization to look at what different strategies, strategies we could deploy. So community organizing is definitely the, the number one um, in engaging community residents. So as Anna mentioned, and Josana as well, of being able to have collective voice and collective power to really transform the power systems. Um, for us, another tool in our in our kit as a development organization was purchasing uh, property and building affordable housing. So one of the drivers in our communities was the Metro Gold Line extension, a light rail extension that's coming through the neighborhood. So we we brought together our organizing efforts and our development efforts and really focused our acquisition along the Gold Line in Bowl Heights, where now we have. Um, seven different developments along the gold line and in Bowl Heights there's a rich and long history of organizing and activism and collectively our work and the work of our partners we've been able to um, not have the tidal wave of gentrification hit this neighborhood as it has surrounding neighborhoods so organizing is really key looking at land use, housing policies, protection, tenant protections, um, and then where that opportunity is for ownership to remove land from speculation and um, where we're at an evolution with supporting the land trust is that piece of having community residents own in, in a, land, a community land trust model. Great, thanks. Um, Anna, Roxana, do you wanna jump yeah. in? Yeah, I could add. I could add a, just some of the experience in Santana around um, strategies to confront um, gentrification. So it it's it started and has included from the creation of affordable housing at the levels of affordability that are required. Um, which for Orange County, as you saw early on, the median income of the county is above eighty four thousand. Um, so affordability really. Um, can fail to address, you know, or to meet the kinds of affordability that families that are making 25,000 or less require. Um, so really pushing for whenever there is affordable housing for there to be um, more built at extremely low income levels. Uh, and this also turned into um, an inclusionary housing ordinance that in this that in Santana is called the Housing Opportunities Ordinance that requires all new development to have a percentage, 15% of it to build um, affordable housing. But we've also seen that that isn't enough. And really, right now, um, grassroots efforts and other community um, organizations are coming together in coalition to push for just cause evictions as tenant protection policies. Um, and, and a rent control ordinance that could limit the, um, the increase of rents. Um, so both of these are, are efforts that are taking folks to um, gather signatures as a ballot initiative. And the first, the first uh, round came a, a few years ago and was short by, by, by very few signatures. Um, so it's coming again in, in 2020 and these are just um, additional additional efforts to um, to to re be able to address um, the impacts and and the and the displacement. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, anybody else, Roxanne, you want to jump in at all, or? I echo what they uh, were talking about. I, the one thing I wanted to add, because I do think it's it's about public control of land is really critical. It's about rent control and building affordable housing. Um, we have a big um, statewide ballot initiative that many organizations are going to be part of this coming year called Schools and Communities First to try and reform Proposition 13 that eviscerated public budgets um, and go back just with um, property where people don't live, so not for apartments, not for single family homes, not for any residential property, but for commercial property to really pay their fair share um, and to really shift um, the conversation so that 
we're expanding public budgets, having more money for the kinds of things we care about. And um, as Isela and Anna were saying, you know, community organizing and our ability to um, to win at the ballot box is a critical piece of that. That that has to be one of the key strategies. Great, thanks. Uh, another question I want to ask. I, I think this to both uh, Roxanne and Isela. You know, so in uh, in Los Angeles in particular, in LA County, um, what have been uh, the key elements that you see in terms of building a social justice movement infrastructure? Roxanne, you want to go first this time? Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we've all talked a little bit about it. Um, one is that any organizing we do has to be intersectional. We have to think about all the parts of our movement. We have to think about multiracial organizing. I think those pieces are really critical. And I think we've had some really great leadership um, in LA to kind of set the tone for that approach because none of us can win alone. You know, we can't be focused just on our organizational strength because it won't translate to the kind of transformative change we want to see if we're not thinking about our whole movement ecosystem. And I'd say one thing that I think you hear throughout all of what the three of us are talking about is, you know, we really need to step in to govern, right? We need to not be afraid of aiming at actual governing power for the communities that we care about um, and ensuring that the folks that we're organizing with who are the most active, um, who are the most impacted, I meant to say, are really leading that work. Yeah, thanks, um, Isela. And maybe say a little bit too, you had that slide where you talked about resistance to regeneration. So, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there was a deep thought process that went into that evolution. Yeah, so definitely concur with, with Roxana about the where we anchor and in the infrastructure in LA on organizing. Um, our organizations really believe in being part of a broader movement. And I think that um, just as, as we're shifting our framework within um, our organization, uh, we're starting to see and feel and experience with partners also um, a shift in, or a, a, the acknowledgement and the potential for a shift around the, the infrastructure because um, we, we, we all confront uh, the similar challenges of being able to have um, the winds that will get us to the point of our community residents really being uh, able to live uh, in a place where they could thrive regardless of their income, regardless of their immigration status, um, uh, gender, sexuality, all the different components of intersectionality. So within the, I think one of the pieces that's giving us a boost within our current infrastructure is the, the increasing pressures around housing, housing and displacement. Um, Ten years ago, we, in, particularly on, in the coalitions that we participate in, um, that are organizing base, we were one of the few that were talking about um, housing, and there was a few more that talked about tenant protections. And now, just about in every space, whichever sector, the the crisis has really reached an epidemic where it's widespread. Now, the experience of the potential of displacement and the the transformation that's not led by community residents uh, just creating that displacement is so widely felt that that is also creating for us, like what's a different way for us to engage with each other, be in space with each other, bring our membership bases together um, for folks to see that. So the, the piece of our cycle of regeneration also includes um, a, a, an evolution to the infrastructure of our movement building that looks at the intersections and really figure it, or we're in a space of trying to figure out how, how we leverage our wins and, and what what is it that's needed to rocket us into that next level, um, particularly around making sure that the residents that have been part of all these these wins and successes, that they continue to be able to be here to, to benefit from them. Yeah. Great, thank you. Anna, I wanted to ask you about uh, social movement infrastructure in in Orange County, and obviously that's much more recent in, in a lot of ways. So um, you're probably living it now. Um, how? What has been key, and you know, have you been able to? Uh, have there been like lessons learned from LA that have been applied in Orange County, or have you had to do things differently? Yeah, I, I guess I had to describe a little bit about like what has been in place in Orange County. I think it was. Um, 
really important to have spaces and um, uh, long, fast forward to today to be able to own some of those spaces. I know my experience as a young person started um, playing music at a cultural center and um, and that cultural center was was tiny and first started out of people's homes. Um, so being able to have space where young folks can come together and organize um, and like Isela shared, that's very culturally relevant um, Right, that uh, that for us that uh, you know culture translated into power because it was our ability to um, to know our history and 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 to be and to exist and to be ourselves um, and and to do that in within a context and of erasure um, or assimilation was really powerful. So um, from having just you know spaces where we could come and meet and gather um, to to really. Um, the grassroots, you know, organizing that was then uplifted and supported and resourced, um, that was really important. Strategies were where we would go door to door and we would um, invite people to join coalitions. I, I, I think that also um, was a, a total growth and, and, and a learning process because even coalition, coalition um, experiences were you know, either organizational leaders at the table or um, well-known individuals at the table who had the ability to make decisions, but hardly were meetings in, you know, in Spanish or really inviting the 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 residents, you know, living in the in the homes that or in the neighborhoods that were being targeted for gentrification. So, um, learning to 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 grow in that way and to incorporate and to equalize even the you know the playing field and the experience within our um, within our organizing has been really important. And I would say um, today and looking looking forward. Um, something that you said I was sharing made me think about, you know, the, the immediate needs that even community members, you know, that community members who organize have um, and our ability to create infrastructure that addresses emergency situations. Um, and there's you know, a, a, a lot of learning that we've done from, again, strategies in Latin America and, and, and one community member of the BHC brought the idea of a savings and credit cooperative um, that uh, is still in the process of, of formalizing because of course there there are there are some restrictions and um, and, and challenges um, but the thought that the idea behind it is that people can pool their money um, and to and support each other in moments of uh, um, of emergency very much based on the tandas and cundinas mm -hmm. and, and lending circles um, so I think all of these you know have been important pieces uh, that lay out kind of the soft infrastructure, you know, physical physical infrastructure as well with the ability to have and own our spaces. And Steve, I did want to add just around, you know, the um, ways in which we fight displacement. I mean, in Santana, there is an, um, an uh, you know, an enormous amount of public land um, that, that the city owns because it's a golf course or that is in the city of Santana because it's a hundred acre golf course or because it was taken up for a transportation project along wide corridors. And so, you know, again, that's an opportunity if that, if that is, um, you know, to, to be able to take that land off of the speculative market and to keep it and, and to make it permanently accessible um, and, and affordable to community residents. So definitely all of that adds to the important, the needed infrastructure for social movement. Great. Um, I wanted to ask another question, which was, you know, sort of about policy and, and the path to the policy. So, you know, uh, talk a little bit about the difference between a policy that gets passed mm -hmm you know, sort of as a technical matter without an organizing strategy uh, versus one that gets passed with an organizing strategy. And how does that affect the ability to implement the policy? I mean, I can, I, we're thinking a lot about this right now. We, we do direct work um, organizing non-union retail workers. Um, and we've been working with them on a scheduling policy. And the, you know, the initial step was that we surveyed about 900 retail workers and figured out really how the lack of access to enough hours and the lack of regular hours was making their lives really difficult. Um, we built a committee of leaders who really identified, you know, what are the key things that they wanted to build some democratic control over in the workplace that would both stabilize their incomes, that would make the, you know, 
not having to be on call, knowing that you could maybe take a class at college or you could pick your kids up after school or take a sick day, all of these things. Um, so, you know, at every stage of the survey, you know, our, our committee of leaders was looking at the results and weighing in on, on the ultimate study that we wrote up about it and with UCLA. And then during the policy campaign, you know, once we figured out what are the key pieces that we wanted to see passed, you know, those worker leaders are engaged throughout the process because, you know, if you pass a policy that isn't the result of a fight, then it's like the tree falling in the desert, right? I mean, one of the challenges with our family leave in California, which is awesome, but lots of people either don't know about it or don't know how they can safely take advantage of that right without losing their jobs. And so without, you know, we spend much longer on implementation of policy than we do winning it in the first place. And that is all about organizing, right? If we're not using a policy to organize leaders, to build people's um, capacity to continue to engage, and then ultimately, to, it just doesn't get to scale, right? It doesn't, people don't take advantage of rights that they don't know that they have, or that they weren't involved in winning for themselves. Okay, thanks. Um, and, and I would add that it, for, for organizations that, uh, organizations like, like ours, all of us that are on, on this webinar right now, um, talking to everybody is that it's about power building, right? So uh, to have a policy pass without organizing means a missed opportunity around power building and engaging residents in, in a longer term vision. Um, though I will uplift part of our reality at, within a nonprofit structure and, and funding structures that, um, and, and that we are operating within multiple systems, um, including that um, as, as an uplifted, Historically, the the work is done at a um, quote unquote leadership formal leadership of a staff um, of organizations. That, that that's a challenge, right? Because there's there's opportunities that can come up that are in line, um, but that that it's uh, an opportunity. It's like oh, we need to have someone here tomorrow. That mm -hmm. that's a challenge to be able to bring someone out. Um, or be able to connect residents in the way that, that we would love to be able to have every single time. And then with the fact of, of our funding and, and keeping that up, the, the wins um, per how, how some of our foundation partners want to see um, also make it a little bit more challenging. But that, that's the biggest difference. Like if we're in, in it for power building, then we need the intentionality of engaging residents on, mm -hmm. on every policy opportunity. And that's aligned with the vision that, that's ongoing, that folks are a part of. Um, I think for, for us in Los Angeles, there's starting to be greater opportunities around community land trust. And um, just this week, we were at the County Board of Supervisors, because there was an introduction uh, by Supervisor Hilda Solis on uh, a policy around anti-displacement and really aligning and looking at where their infrastructure projects are going to happen and how they can align housing resources and prioritize the communities that are potential for displacement. Um, that came around really quick. It, it, it aligns with opportunities, but it was a challenge to have community residents um, attend the, the, the meeting and the hearing because of how quickly it came around. But yeah, it's power, power building is critical. Um, for longer term transformation and, and the that's why it's a that's the biggest difference between passing a policy without engaging residents and passing a policy with engaging residents. Great. Thanks. Uh, Anna, did you want to say anything more? Um, no, I, I'm good. Yeah. I All right. Let me go to some audience questions. So we, we do have some and uh, I may intersperse another one of my own at some point, but let's go. Um, you know, one of the questions uh, was for uh, Roxanne in particular, and it involved the um, LA Live project and how did you, well, how did you go about creating a strategy that allowed uh, for inclusion of affordable housing in in LA Live? Talk a little bit about the process of doing that. I think, I mean, the first process is is a question of understanding power, and we use a tool that Anthony Thigpen, who created Scope and California Calls, um, 
created called the power analysis because you, you first have to understand right what power do we have to in this case move city council members and the mayor to make the, the demands of the de to back our demands up with the developer right and to to connect you know when we do a cba it's a signed document it's a legal agreement between us and the developer that then gets added into the development agreement between the developer and the public agency so you've got some enforcement mechanisms so the first step is to know how much power you have so that you can be realistic um, about your demands without you know i mean still being very um pushing as hard as as you can and so you know the other piece was you know trying to make sure that um people didn't make side deals so as an example the developer was pretty ready to offer the hotel workers union an agreement to be neutral to let workers decide without a fight whether they wanted to be union or not um because they recognized that the union had built some power over you know 15 or so years um and on the community side we didn't have quite as much power and so you know we went to the union and we said please don't sign that agreement until we've won the affordable housing and that's a tough thing to do, right? These are elected folks, elected by their members to represent hotel worker interests, but hotel workers don't just exist in the eight hours at work. They also are renters and community residents and care about affordable housing. Um, and so, you know, the union gritted its teeth and it held on and it did not sign that agreement until community, um, you know, the rest of the coalition had concluded the affordable housing um, win. So, I mean, that was the way uh, that we were able to do it. And we were kind of, kind of like Anna was talking about, looking at a 20% um, inclusionary requirement and trying to make sure that it was affordable, not just for folks at maybe 80 or 100% of median income, but down closer to 50 or, or below. Great, thanks. Um, another question that came from the audience, you know, was in, You've all talked about this at some level, and, and, and Manuel Pastor was talking about, you know, solidarity economy, and but, you know, what are the what what would you say are the key um, solidarity practices that allow for both, you know, um, you know, I'll say in addition to a commitment to deep organizing, which I take as obvious, but, you know, that allow for both material and and policy success. Well, on, the, on this one. There, there's a lot of work that needs to be done around values and um, bringing folks together around radical imagination of how it could look very different. Um, when we started having deeper conversations within the organization about land trust and co cooperative um, work-owned businesses, um, there was a couple of staff that are like, why are we doing something new if what the strategies that we're doing um, also achieve stability in housing? And I shared with them that this wasn't this, this wasn't something new. The the solidarity economy, cooperative housing, these, these models are part of um, a lot of ancestral ways uh, of being together, um, the supporting the, this notion of it takes a village, right? Um, and I shared with them, if any, any folks have seen the, the movie Hidden Figures, there's a scene in the movie where, um, you know, the main character, she's, she's uh, on that big old board doing all these equations, and they're trying to go like, what's the new equation that's gonna get this person to the moon? And she rushes across the campus and she pulls an old book and she's like, it wasn't about something new, it was about going back to something old. So we have a different environment right now. However, it's been so many years and for, for many of our communities, our um, ancestral ways or cultural practices have literally been violently beat out of us. And part of being able to be successful in this work from our perspective and, and why for us, uh, a lot of this work is housed within our cultural vitality. It's about being able to be in community and, and have experiences around true democratic processes, collective decision making, um, solidarity with each other, understanding where everybody's at, and being able to build from a pay place of values. And if, if our values are supporting everybody and ensuring that everybody has a home, that everybody has basic needs met, and our current system doesn't support that, then what do we need? And that's how we ended up with the land trust and worker-owned cooperatives and, and shared 
um, equity co cooperative housing. But that's really the, the anchor from our perspective for success that then you build into like then the, the capital that's needed to do this, the money aspect of it. But first we have to work on that value piece and, and having uh, more people experience a different way of being in community. Great. Anna, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I entirely agree, and um, and and that those are similar beginnings for us. And I echo that it's not something new because these were strategies that were brought from folks who've experienced it in in their in their own countries of origins. Um, and then it just connects globally to a different approach, um, and, and much needed today as well. Um, I think I wanted to speak a little bit to the policy piece because I think what it requires is asking for a different approach to economic development. And um, in our, in just looking at the, the history of you know, how that's taken place in Santana, there's, um, there's been certainly like major investments from the city through grant, um, through uh, grant dollars like the community development block grants um, and reduced leases um, or, uh, or, or um, sale of land when there are strategies um, that, 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 that um, council members will get behind, like the creation of an arts district um, or uh, a, um, targeting, a, a targeting a different class um, uh, and targeting people to come into the city. Um, but that same approach is, or sorry to just wanted to add or to bring somebody over like Amazon right but the but the same approach um, isn't thought about when we in focusing on who our population is and what are economic development strategies that could um, uh, improve the quality of life for those who are already here and so I think that there's major opportunities to look at how can there be you know, procurement efforts that can employ your local community um, and through models of, of the solidarity economy where it's, there's a value, you know, sharing in values and there's also specific decision making um, mm -hmm. and collective governance. So I think that's how, that's just what I would add about connecting it to policy. Great. Thanks. Um... <laughs> Well, Tana, there's a qu another question for you, and this will not surprise you, I don't think. Uh, it's, you know, how do you enforce these collect, you know, CBAs, these mm -hmm. community development agreements? You, know, you have nice things on paper, but then you have to make it reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's important to have um, a legal agreement, right? So that we can, you know, with our own attorneys enforce, um, but also to have that agreement um, be adopted as part of the development agreement with the city so that you know we had um, strategies for just economy sage hosted and still does an enforcement committee that we were part of that residents were part of um, that met regularly with the developer and that developer was pretty cooperative at that point and and we were able to work through challenges and and really make stuff happen um, Likewise, with the North Hollywood, the developer had to report to the then Community Redevelopment Agency on how many jobs and where those folks had been hired from and how many units of affordable housing had been built and was able to achieve the goals. Um, you know, and you have the opportunity, if you need to use the stick, of going back and exercising your political muscle. Um, to put pressure on. And the same is true, you know, we haven't done as many of those individual agreements in a long time and have been focusing more on these industry-wide policies, but the same is true there. And and again, I, I know I said it before, but you have to put twice as much organizing effort into implementation as you do into winning the policy. And it's a lot less sexy and it doesn't get as much support. But it, if you don't do that, it's not real to the people who fought for it and, and it, you know, it just doesn't happen. Great. Um, so there was a question that sort of, I think this is kind of about uh, allyship in a way. So it's sort of like you're not in Boyle Heights or you're not in Santana, but how how can people who are outside of these neighborhoods support your work? Well, um, there's, there's always resources, right? <laughs> Dollars to, to support the work as, um, as you started off at the beginning of the webinar. Um, but then there's there's a part 
we're, we're all organizers being able to to change have that be part of our lens that i'm an organizer even if i'm not there i'm learning about this let me share with a neighbor a friend the inciting conversation that can uh, shift the radical imagination of folks of, of how things can be is also helpful um, in in creating and, and contributing to to the paradigm shift um, that, that we're working on. Um, I think another part where um, when appropriate or available, depending on where, where folks are at, um, particularly in the state of California, there's also statewide policies that that, that uh, we're moving um, here um, or around all of these issues. And um, I think there, there's also through other coalitions, uh, Right to the City is one of them, where we're continuously looking at like what's the federal policy that could help change environments in other um, states and cities that would help organizing on the ground. So, so there's multiple ways that people can connect and support, um, even if they're not within our city or within our neighborhood. Um, but being able to contribute to narrative shift is, um, from my perspective, a very important contribution that people um, all over can can do. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I, I want to add um, the just growing our network too. To see if people are in other places and the work that you're doing, um, being able to share lessons uh, and you know talk about our context and and be able to um, yeah support each other even even from from far away. I would say take to take the opportunity to visit too and to do exchanges. I think that's been such a nice experience. Uh, we were able to drive cross country to visit um, Operation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. We've traveled to Wisconsin with the Menominee community and they've come over here. And we recently received folks from Kern. Um, I know we took a trip to LA at the, you know, in 2013 as part of the visioning of the building of the community. So um, just being able to come and be received in in um in and sharing and building relationships um of that kind um uh, being part of uh just whether they're in formal networks or, or networking up to you know to different things like um the common futures you know network where i met steve um i think it goes a long way to to see how we're you know, we ha we're connected and we have you know support even if it's not right next door um, and then i also be you know echoing on the on the dollar and um and the power of our own capital uh I, there are, there are more and more strategies that i know we want to implement in santana and that uh folks for example in boston are doing and that's like community capital campaigns and how can we um also create pools of, of funding that we choose to invest in you know, where we choose to invest and um and for and for that to go towards uh, whether it's cooperative businesses that are starting or funds that will take you know control and ownership of land that's community governed. So just um, wanting to add those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're part of the Partnership for Working Families Network, and that's one of the ways in which we also get to. It's amazing to be able to go to other places and really see what they're doing, um, and and try and think about how do we even on a city to city level, build relationships of power among organizations um, that can help drive an agenda that's national, but rooted really in places. Great. Um, so I had a couple questions. They were kind of about um, macro or federal trends. You know, so, you know, so at the federal level right now, there's like, well, I could talk about a lot of things at the federal level right now, but one of the things the questioners asked about was, you know, the cutbacks in 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 federal health care. Um, you know, there, at, then there's the question of like the the private sector economy in Los Angeles, which may not be all that that you desire it to be. You know, so how do you um, pursue your interests in in sort of a broader um, environment that's sometimes pretty complicated? Well, I think the broader broader environment is always complicated. <laughs> um, it, it's just you know it, it's shifting, and I think that's part of um, of our work. In we contribute to that shift, right? And there's um, there's always opportunities to have some sort of movement in the direction um, that we want to see. 
um, across uh, different different policy areas or issue areas. Um, so so for us, I know um, just to name one around housing and, and, and who's been appointed to those spaces, we were definitely holding our breath um, for for a bit there. If there was going to be any resources coming from the federal government um, to be able to develop housing and. Um, there's a lot of mobilization efforts in our sector that that aren't traditional. Um, most uh, most development organizations don't have organizing arms, so to be able to advocate for for those resources to not disappear um, was significant. And there's also growing conversations around um, how do we contribute to the conversation so that the resources don't get further restricted to serve undocumented residents and and populations. So um, so the the if anything the current federal environment i think has contributed contributed to us um, moving away from our comfort zone and thinking how we engage um, with a variety of different sectors in a different way all with the same goal of being able to um, provide that support and environment for for all residents to thrive uplifting in particular the folks that have been most disenfranchised and are most challenged by the, the shifting federal environment. Yeah, I mean, we're lucky that California is now the fifth largest economy in the world in the sense that there's a heft and a way that we can build out power here and have a great impact, you know, even when we can't move stuff at the federal level. Um, but the feds obviously can still have a huge and incredibly negative impact on, on people's lives. You know, I will say too, and I think it's part of the radical imagination piece that Isela was talking about, that, you know, we have the power to really regulate our economy so that it serves our needs and not the other way around. And it, sometimes we feel like we don't have that power, but in fact, you know, we've had that experience regionally of regulating, you know, key parts of the private sector economy and knowing that we have the power to use tools that already exist to really make shifts in the economy um, and to embrace the kinds of ideas that both Anna and Isela were talking about, whether it's worker co-ops or community land trusts. Great. Um, I've got a question about um, asset-based community development. Um, and and I was, I, the question really is, you know, is that, are you using that? Do you use asset mapping in, in your community organizing work and, and how do you use it? Yeah, I can share a bit. Uh, the, the Community Land Trust Thrive is looking at a um, parcel of land uh, as and is in negotiations for the development of an urban agriculture site. Um, but coming up with that in coming up with a with a project of what was going to be developed on that land took uh, community participation and by design because Thrive went door to door to that neighborhood and worked with local uh, the local university to design a survey um, that would look at different things including you know what what uses would uh, community members take most advantage of but also what um, skill sets and experience was already in the community and uh, I think that was really instrumental in, in designing um, the use uh, of the parcel and, and because it was what are the skill sets what are the assets um, that already exist in that neighborhood what was there historically um, and uh, what can add and, and bring benefit to the conditions of health and well-being to that neighborhood. Um, so it's really something that's not typically done or seen in development when projects are designed entirely by, um, by, by the constructor, the, the developing company. Um, but in this case, being able to, to, to jump in um, and understand the landscape of the existing community is one example where, where, where we see that in something. Great. Yeah. Um, another question I got, uh, I think this one's probably for Roxana, but uh, at least I'll, I'll throw it at you and then you can toss it back. But, uh, you know, it, it's about working with unions, you know, and, and obviously, Lane was founded uh, partially you know, by the Central mm -hmm. Labor Council or the LA Fed, um, you know, and and labor unions can be great allies, and they can also be 
bureaucratic in ways that can be challenging for, for organizing. So yeah, talk a little bit about those tensions and how they're resolved. And they're not always re resolved, but I will say the labor <laughs> movement is not like a, a monolith, right? You have more progressive unions, you have unions that are more inward facing. You know, one thing to remember is that these are democratic institutions in the sense that their leaders are elected. And so they are accountable to the folks who elected them. And sometimes that can in a funny way, make things a little bit more conservative. If your feeling is, you know, I got elected, I got to serve my members, these are their immediate interests, and I can't be worrying about this stuff over here, as opposed to doing the kind of leadership development mm -hmm. internally that helps you create a much bigger vision for your membership about what's winnable and what's important and where the focus should be. So, you know, I would say not all unions are the same, um, you know, we we definitely partner with the labor movement, both because they are that is some of the power on our on the progressive side of the ledger, and we want to be able to use that power to drive, you know, a progressive agenda. Um, and because you know the the members of the unions that we work with are the community folks where we're doing organizing, like in Long Beach, um, you know, so there's not this distinction of worker over here, community person over there, it's the same human being. And so, you know, the unions that we've worked most closely with recognize that. Great, thanks. Um, so I thought I'd close with one last question, which, you know, is an impossible question, but um, it's sort of what is the unfinished agenda? So we don't have a huge amount of time, but any last thoughts about where, what lies ahead for, for each of you guys? Um, maybe like a minute each, if you can manage that. I mean, I think um, to this question, I'll, I'll contribute a little bit, um, building off of the, the asset question of that what lies ahead for our agenda is being able to to hold both a uh, people-centered agenda, uplifting that our assets in the community go beyond buildings and land, and and it includes um, people uh, within that lens, and the the that we're holding the also the financial need and the dollar need to be able to, to fulfill that. So our unfinished agenda is figuring out that sweet spot of we would keep uh, community centered and, and priorities um, while confronted with that challenge of, of resources and capital um, to be able to, to manifest the, the vision of, of a, an environment where everyone can thrive. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Yeah, on our end, um, uh, growing the um, economic justice uh, components of our work. Last year, we started Cooperación Santana as a cooperative developer um, organization that can support the incubation of worker cooperatives and also training and, and um, had 25 graduates from the first curriculum in 15 different businesses. Um, so growing that work, uh, growing the, the, the community land trust as well. Um, and, but I also have to speak to the transition of the building healthy communities because it, it was a 10 year commitment and that in those 10 years are, are up. And so um, it, it, in Santana, the organizing was happening before and it will continue to happen, you know, um, through this transition. And a lot of what is surfacing is really the desire to see a, um, a culture of organizing that um, holds th those most impacted, that continues to create opportunities for the decision making in, um, and, and shared ownership, um, but that also uh, supports transformation from the personal to the to the community to the community to the social um, so that's that's going to be exciting we're still undergoing that process what will it look like how um, will our, our collaboration reconfigure um, but we're starting by rooting in important transformative principles um, so we're looking forward to that great thanks uh, Roxana yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think for us too, it's really about doubling down on the organizing. You know, we definitely with, with our allies and partners have a bunch of policy wins under our belt and certainly have seen some real improvements in, in as a result of that. But we are an extremely long way 
from having a government and an economy that is really genuinely democratic and people-centered. And so we feel like our job is like, what do we do over the next decade to really build a great deal of power? And we're part of building healthy communities in Long Beach, and we want to really trans take some of the community organizing we've done there and really build a membership institution, right, that can play at a political level, that can continue to engage all of the community issues and really create a vehicle for leadership development. Um, and likewise, with our retail worker organizing or our port organizing, you know, we want to challenge ourselves to get to scale while not um, sacrificing, you know, real leadership development. Um, so for us, it's 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 got to be doubling down on organizing. Great. Um, well, uh, that brings us to the conclusion of this webinar. We could talk for a lot longer, I'm sure. But thanks so much to uh, Ana Sura, uh, Roxana Tainan, and, and Isela Gracian for an excellent conversation. Um, I'll mention that in the chat box, there's a link if you would like to uh, make a donation to the Nonprofit Quarterly's Economic Justice Program, which will be matched by the O'Shea Foundation. We encourage you to do that. And we encourage you to join us on uh, February 20th uh, for our um, next webinar in the series. So, um, and that will be focused on the Black Belt and the Mississippi Delta. So thanks so much to everyone and uh, see you in a month. Thanks for having Thank us. Bye, everybody. Bye.